Welcome back to my channel. I'm Brian Kapke, and in this video, we're going to be talking about automating your data workloads. And that means we're going to talk about schedulers versus orchestrators. And please consider supporting me on Patreon, link in the description. Let's jump in. We're going to talk about what's the problem we're trying to solve. We'll discuss job schedulers versus data orchestrators to solve that problem. Then we'll talk about what is a job scheduler, what is a data orchestrator, when to use the job scheduler versus when to use a data orchestrator, and then we'll wrap things up in a nice little package. So what's the problem we're trying to solve? Basically, way back, the problem became it's becoming more and more cumbersome to manually run some programs. This can be something you gradually become aware of when you're doing your job, but most of the time, you should start really with the perspective of, I want to be automating the execution of programs. Let's give some examples. So you want to automate the execution of some work. Now, most of the time I'm talking about something like executing an ETL job, right? You got to get all the data from wherever it's coming from, transform it, land it, and move it into a destination where it can be used for reporting, training models, or whatever the business wants to do. Or you may just want to run some utilities like a Spark optimization or repartitioning some Spark tables. Another good example would be you need to execute reports on some sort of a regular schedule and send those reports to the users. Or you could just want to send a letter every day to your Aunt Tilly because she gets lonely. The point is that you can run any program you want on a job scheduler. Now I want to talk about two types of job schedulers because I reflected on this quite a bit to sort of distinguish the kinds you see around yourself. The general service type of job schedule like cron for Unix or Linux or the Windows Task Scheduler. It's been around for a long time and it's basically there to just automate anything you want to automate. And also, if you go way back, as I do in my Wayback Machine, IBM mainframes had excellent job schedulers, still do, called JES, which is the job entry system, and a special language to run your jobs called job control language. So that's a really good example of a awesome, to be honest, job scheduler, and something to this day I have yet to find an equivalent. There are also data platform specific schedulers. Since I'm talking more about data, I'm not going to talk about other kinds of specific schedulers, but ones that are sort of integrated into our data service tools. For example, on premise, you might use something like SQL Server Agent. If you're on Azure, you can't use SQL Server Agent when you use just the Azure SQL database. But if you use managed instance, it's sort of a higher level and more performant and really designed for production workloads. Managed Instance does support SQL agents, so that's pretty good, it's built in. Databricks workflows also are a job scheduler that are built into Databricks. Now Databricks workflows are a little special case because they started off as being a very basic kind of run a notebook, and they've expanded into being something more closely, I would say, associated with an orchestrator. So they're kind of a mix at this point and moving more and more towards being an orchestrator, but it is still data platform specific. So another service is Azure Data Factory. This is an Azure specific ETL, ELT, data movement and transformation tool, whatever you want to call it. But it also supports scheduling. And to a limited degree, you could even say also some level of orchestration. And I'll explain the differences in one minute. So what is a job scheduler? It's a service that automates the execution of a job, which may be a single task or a set of tasks. The key thing about a job scheduler is that you configure when you want the job to run. That's kind of key here, right? So you have different things they call job triggers. It could be, and usually is, something like a time schedule. Run this every Tuesday at 8 p.m. or run it daily at 5 p.m. Or maybe you just want to say, run this every hour, or every 15 minutes. Most job schedulers can support any of that kind of time-based automation. Sometimes you need to base it on like an event, like a file landing in storage or in a folder or FTP servers or something like that. That sometimes requires a little playing around with, like to have something running every 10 minutes that checks to see if a file's there, like if it's not supported right in the job scheduler. But some tools actually have event-based triggering, and so that can also be really handy for job scheduling. And sometimes, and the only case I can think of right now is in the case of Databricks workflows, but they've added a feature where a task can call another job, which is extremely powerful because now you can sort of create a hierarchy of jobs from one job. So that's a really nice feature. So let's take a look at generic schedulers. Now, Cron has been around for a long time. It predates Linux, actually. Cron goes all the way back to the Unix world. I mean, we're talking like the 1960s. Most of you people are probably not alive. So Cron goes back a long way. We can see in this picture, it is a command line utility 
And what you actually type in is not cron, but cron tab. And then you pass parameters to it. So this is typical, you know, command line utility. Dash L says list jobs. And you can see here, it's listing the jobs. And the run dash parts is the script or whatever program you want to run. That's the name of it. But you can also see that there's a whole bunch of different schedules. So cron supports multiple schedules. You don't have to just say every week at 5 p.m., but you could say, I also want to run it, say, on Tuesdays, an additional time, or weekly, or monthly. So you can combine different types of schedules to execute your task. This is an example in this screen of just setting up a trigger for a Windows task scheduler. And obviously, since it's Windows, it's not really based on a command line, but it has a GUI that you can go in and create a task. And you can see here, you've got the same sort of scheduling flexibility that you would expect, but you also have the ability to set when should this be turned off? How long do you want this job to keep running? Things like that, which is a nice thing to be able to specify. So let's talk a minute about data platform specific schedulers. This is an example of a SQL Server agent job. Now, I used this for a long time, lots of years on SQL Server on-prem environment. Very powerful, awesome job scheduler, to be honest, because what I like about it is, as you can see here, you've got a job definition, but you can schedule multiple job steps. And each of these steps can be configured to run a SQL statement, call a store procedure, call a function, run a SQL Server integration services package, really just about anything you can think of, and even running like command prompt or PowerShell scripts. So you have a lot of flexibility here, and the ability to create discrete steps in order is really powerful. Now, if I back up a minute, I want you to see the on success and on failure options. Another nice feature, if any given task fails, you can say what you want to do, and the default is to quit the job and report this failed. You can also say what you want to do on success. So there's a lot of flexibility being able to do that, and if you look over, on the right, you can see there's a lot of other options. You can set, of course, schedules, but you can also set alerts, like what happens when something goes wrong, who to notify. You've got notifications, so you can email, you can send text notifications. I can't remember all the options, but there's a lot of options to alert people that something's wrong when the job goes awry. So this is really great. And as I mentioned, I've used this for years, but I believe on the Azure environment, if you want this, you would have to either do it in a VM and you do have to pay for it as part of the SQL Server licensing, or you can use the managed instance version of SQL Server on Azure and you should get this functionality. This example is of a Databricks workflow. Now you can see here, it's more visual and it's a little more complex, right? We have a step or task that runs a given thing. In this case, it's running a notebook then it's going to run other notebooks. So it starts with one step, clicks ingest. After that's executed, the arrow is indicating the next step is run sessionize. And because right next to it with no lines between them, orders ingest is listed, that means they can run in parallel. But you see the two lines pointing to the match box. That means that before match can run, sessionize and orders ingest has to finish executing. And then match will go on to build features. And then that can run after that's finished, persist features and train in parallel. This kind of a diagram is actually a very simple DAG, a directed acyclic graph. And the key thing there is acyclic meaning you can't cycle, you can't loop or point backwards. So you can see it's just like a hierarchy chart. Now I mentioned, and I will talk about in future videos, how extensive the workflow engine in Databricks has become. It is specific to Databricks, so you must have a Databricks service that you're paying for to get it, but it really has become so functional that it is more of an orchestrator now than a scheduler. But if all you really want to do is just some basic job scheduling, it's great for that too. Let's talk about popular schedulers. So we talked about cron on Linux and cron is typically something you'd execute either a bash or Python script from. And you can only run one thing really. So you're going to run it and then that script will do whatever it needs to do. The Windows task scheduler will typically execute batch files, right? Command files or PowerShell scripts. And SQL Server Agent, we saw, can execute things like any of the SQL services, uh, PowerShell or command scripts, and pretty much anything that surrounds that. But it could really automate almost anything, but it is designed around SQL Server. Now, commercial tools out there, you might have heard of something called CA7. That's been around for a long time, and that's a very powerful commercial job scheduler. And on the cloud, there is Azure Automation. I'll put a link in the description where I have a whole series on Azure Automation. I like it a lot. It's free, very flexible, and it integrates beautifully into Azure. The securitizing and all that's built in. 
And fairly recently, they extended it to support Python 3. So you can use PowerShell or you can use Python 3. I wouldn't recommend Python 2 because that's been deprecated, but some good options here. There's also a service called Azure Batch, which is more scalable than using Azure Automation. So it's designed to support parallel execution of tasks and do a lot of really nice features. And then of course we talked about Databricks workflows, but I'm throwing it in again. And of course there's Azure Functions. And I only put it in here because sometimes people just need to automate something on Azure and they decide that an Azure Function is the simplest way to do it. Now I'd be very careful with that because Azure Functions are all sort of standalone. It's not really designed to be a job scheduling service, but yeah, you can just put it in, put it on a schedule and it will run something for you. So that is an option. So when should we use a scheduler, Brian? I mean, what's going on here? What should we do here? Well, this is an example of a very straightforward ETL job. So imagine the task going on, and this is something very typical in SQL Server Agent. Step one, copy sales to staging. So you have storage on the left, right? Maybe it's a relational database, maybe it's just flat files, but you're gonna bring the data in and copy it into a table. We'll say either Spark table, a Delta table type thing, or Snowflake, or it could be just a database, right? But that's landing in a sales table. The next step is to copy the customer data into a customer table. And then you can see step three is gonna join those two tables together and save the results as customer sales. Step four is going to take the customer sales and transform it by adding any kind of things, filtering, maybe removing nulls, maybe adding some calculated columns, whatever it needs to do to transform the data. And that's gonna write out to transformed customer sales. And then from there, it's gonna pull it in and summarize the results and put it out to summarize customer sales. And that would typically be used by maybe Power BI reports or Tableau or something. This is an age old architecture used in the SQL Server environment for years. Databricks has adopted it and they call it the medallion architecture, but it's really been around a long time. So the idea is staging is bronze and then you go to transformed and that's silver and then your aggregated layer is called gold. But this pattern is, is very simple and basic. Now, if all you need to do is just run this job on a daily basis at say 8 p.m., then a job schedule, it seems like the easiest choice. It's simple. And the things you wanna consider is this particular job does not have like conditional branching, right? It's pretty straightforward. Run A, run B, run C, you know, that kind of thing. It does not bring in continuous or streaming data sources, which can add complexity because it's meant to sort of just run at a certain time and finish. And the data dependencies are pretty straightforward. In fact, I'm not really defining data dependencies. I'm just running a task on a schedule. So this is expected to be a pretty simple and reliable process, and I don't expect it to run into many issues, especially if my data sources are like production relational databases that are the production systems for an application. The production applications are pretty good at vetting bad data. They have to have those dependencies and referential integrity and all those things. So if you're pulling from a source like that, you're pretty safe that your data is not going to give you many problems. In summary, this is a fairly typical basic process for a data warehouse. And it's pretty common in Databricks as well as what I can see. So even when you get into the Snowflake and Databricks world, this pattern is fairly common and a job scheduler can support it very nicely. And something that we've forgotten as we've gone on and become all steady art techie now, but a principle that goes back to my early days in programming is KISS. Keep it simple, stupid. The stupid part is to remind you not to forget the first part, which is just keep it simple. Do not add unnecessary complexity. You wanna make sure that you only have as much complexity as you need because it's going to be easier to support. It's gonna be more understandable. If you're using simple tools for scheduling, it doesn't require a lot of training for anyone to pick it up and support it. So that's a really important principle. Sometimes, however, it's not enough to use a job scheduler. And that's when an orchestrator comes in. So orchestrators are a pretty new concept, at least to me. And in fact, I kept confusing when I looked at something like Airflow, like it just looks kind of like a scheduler, but it's got a lot of fancy features. Well, it kind of is. So something like Airflow is really a scheduler on steroids. It gives you lots of features and bells and whistles, but ultimately it is a sort of extended scheduler. But it supports complexity, right? So it has virtually unlimited number of tasks. And you can define task dependencies, and you have also task branching, the DAG kind of thing. There's many layers and potential paths that you can go down, and you should have advanced monitoring and notifications. Like if any part of your DAG fails, you need to know and you need to notify somebody. 
Also, when you've got a complex DAG, you could be running for hours with all these different pieces of a DAG running. You want to make sure that you can start from where you left off or at least have some flexibility about how you restart your job. If you have to start at the beginning again, that may not really be an option in all cases. And that's where orchestrators should shine. Now, usually an orchestrator uses something called a DAG, a directed acyclic graph. And you can see this little diagram here, which shows you, you know, point A, number one task does something. And once it finishes, then two and three can begin. And then once two is finished, then four and five can begin. So that's the idea of a DAG. So I did a review of Airflow a while back, and I would not classify it as a data orchestrator, but I would classify it as an orchestrator. And I'll explain a little bit about why in a minute, but it's because it really supports this slide and not as well the next slide I'm going to talk about, which gets into data integrated types of orchestration. So let's talk about a data orchestrator. It's an orchestrator on data steroids or it's data aware. And it ideally supports the following things, at least in Brian's world, because this is still pretty new uncharted territory. But these are the things I would look for comprehensive support for data lineage. I want to know where a table came from and where that table came from and where that table came from, or I want to know where that table's going and where that's going. In other words, I want to know end to end how this data is created and the flow that it takes through my environment. And that's at a column level as well as an aggregate like table level. I want documentation and reporting. I want to be able to slice and dice and see how this is working. You know, we've got all these great reporting tools for the data itself, but not a lot for the orchestration and the creation and maintenance of that data. So this is something where a data orchestrator is hopefully coming to rescue you. I want data quality integration. I need to make sure that when I'm running my jobs, I'm checking the data quality, that it's good, and that if it isn't good, I can stop the execution and do something about it. Data metrics evaluation is also something that's important. Maybe I expect 10 million rows and I only got five rows, things like that. I need to stop the job, notify people, et cetera. And hopefully, but not necessarily, this is not always supported on orchestrators, but the support for streaming. In other words, instead of just a job schedule or something like Airflow does, support for streaming sources or event triggers or anything that's needed to tell the job when to run. Extensibility is also really important. The ability to include third-party data services like Great Expectations or DBT or any number of services which can extend and improve your overall end-to-end -end processing, really important. And not all data orchestrators are equal in that regard. And something I've left out, but generally the data orchestrators I'm seeing around, they're written in Python. They're typically Python packages or they use a Python package as a sort of wrapper for it. And because of that, you need to be ready to adopt Python programming across the board and make sure you are comfortable that your developers need to know Python programming because while these often will support other languages like Rust or something else, they typically require at least some level of Python programming to, for instance, define a DAG. So this slide shows a few of the popular data orchestrators. So we have Apache Airflow. I would say it's really more of an orchestrator than a Data orchestrator, I have not looked at Prefect yet, so I'll have to take a look at that. I've done an extensive evaluation of Dagster over the last six months, more than anything else, in fact, for a while. And I am extremely impressed with Dagster. I intend to do more about it. It supports all of the features, I think, in my slide before. Its support for streaming may not be fully there yet, but everything else looks really good. And of course, I don't want to leave out these hybrid tools like Databricks Workflows and Azure Data Factory. Databricks Workflows support a lot of data orchestration types of functionality in addition to just being a good job scheduler. And Azure Data Factory is also something that you can use and it works really well with Databricks. They're kind of hand in hand really. Which one makes sense for you depends a lot on your needs. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. So when to use a data orchestrator? Well, I'm gonna start off by warning you, right? Because out there on the internet, you look up something and they're all like, this is better than sliced bread. You gotta use blah, blah, blah. And whether that's Daxter or Airflow or any of the other tools, they all tell you you need them and you gotta use them. But I wanna tell you that with great power comes great responsibility. That came from Spider-Man. I don't know where it came from before that, but I remember that in the first movie. And what do I mean by that? It means you're adding a lot of complexity. This is a whole new tool. It's a, a framework. You're bringing in a lot of complexity and you have to get people trained, and there's more things that can go wrong when you use them. So that's something to be aware of. Parsimony is always really important. Only bring in the complexity you need. It has to have value. Now, if you have a lot of data dependencies that you need to tie together, maybe 
different kinds of scheduling, like some things refresh more often than others. Lots of conditional logic. If this happens, then do this kind of stuff. In your job stream, then that's the point where you may have to think about data orchestration. You need complete data transparencies. So if you have a data pipeline, whether it's for a data warehouse, maybe going to some sort of visualization reporting analytics platform, or being used to build machine learning models, you may need complete transparency, especially if this is something that maybe there's government regulations around, it's going to be audited, things like that. So you're probably looking at the need for data lineage and reporting, data quality, detailed monitoring and tracking. You gotta be able to see everything. Where did it go wrong? When did it go wrong? What table was it? What column was it? These are all important for supporting your data orchestration. As I mentioned before too, you have to be willing to commit to Python. If you're not using Python, then most of the tools that support data orchestration, at least as far as I've seen, you can put comments in the bottom for other tools, but most of them seem to revolve around Python. Generally, it's easier to start simple and then add more complexity as your needs grow than to add over complexity and then not use it half the time. So I'd be very careful to jump to a data orchestrator if it doesn't seem like it's really needed. And something else to consider is when you go to a sort of general data orchestration type of service, you're going to lose the data platform integration features. So Databricks workflows integrate beautifully with Databricks. It can call just about anything you'd ever want to run in Databricks. It already understands the environment. Very easy to tie together. A job can call another job. It's got all those things. If you were running something like Azure Data Factory, it's really well integrated with Azure. It can do all things Azure. And it integrates beautifully with Databricks. So again, those are good reasons to use that. Don't just assume that's not valuable. It actually is. It makes your life easier. You have to knowingly be willing to give that up if you choose to go to data orchestration unless... And this is a good unless, unless you can integrate your data orchestration tool with your data platform integration service. So when do we use a data orchestrator? This slide is just showing us an example DAG, which you can see is a lot more complicated than the job schedule thing we had in like SQL agent or something. That was very basic, but here you can see many different tasks being called, many dependencies between them, parallel execution, beginning and endpoints. This is actually a very simple DAG as DAGs go. Like this would be nothing for Airflow to handle. And in fact, this is an Airflow DAG. Now, one of the things I mentioned about data orchestrators versus orchestrators, if you notice, it's not really clear where your data is coming from and going to in this because this is very task centric. Airflow doesn't really care about what you want to execute. It'll execute anything, which is nice and flexible. But when you're doing data orchestration, it may not be very clear where your data is coming from and where it's going to. Here you can see it's more about what tasks are doing what. So wrapping up, we talked about what's the problem and the problem is automation. And in our case, we're talking about automating data workloads. Typical data workloads are like ETL, ELT. You're basically bringing data in from somewhere, landing it, applying some levels of transformation and then writing it out somewhere, maybe aggregating it to a gold layer as they call it, Databricks, where it's meant to support analytics. And we talked about schedulers versus orchestrators and specifically data orchestrators. And we learned that schedulers are awesome. They're great. And they can do a lot of work for us. And if we can use schedulers and they meet our needs, then I say stop there. Do not go further. But if your needs are more complex, then data orchestrators are probably a better direction to go in. So as I just described what a job scheduler is, it's for relatively simple workloads and basic triggers. And then we talked about data orchestrators, which are really supporting a lot more transparency, data integration, and lots of data services like data quality checks, DAGs, and lots of features that give you end-to-end -end transparency, auditability, and supportability to your data pipelines. So we talked about when to use a job scheduler and when to use a data orchestrator. And I think I've already kind of summarized that in my review. In the end, it comes down to requirements and complexity. The more complex your data load requirements become, the more you will lean towards a data orchestrator. So that's it for this time. Thank you. Please like, share, subscribe, tell your friends about my channel. And until next time, I'm pulling for you. We're all in this together. Thank you.